Welcome back, Rage Nation. Got myself Pete here. That's yeah. not really exciting. We got Senior Dixon. I don't think that's appropriate. And we got Monsieur Leopard. Explorers deserve it. No. Absolutely. I was disgusted. I cannot believe they've done this. Why is wacky? Why is that good? It's just nonsense. I disagree on that. It's not possible. <laughs> We're getting the band back together. We're on ambition. Yeah. Now, we've, now we've got a whole new list of things to complain about. Welcome back, Rage Nation. We are at it again. Got myself Pete here, and today we have, of course, Moen Senior Dixon with us, and we actually have somebody from my local meta who got roped into playing Malifaux and now caught the competitive bug. My good friend Trevor, how are you doing, my friend? Doing well. Showing up, Hello, showing up, Dixon with a with a fancy setup and and a better microphone. Dixon, we're gonna have, hasn't been in use for some time. We're gonna have to have you, Dixon, like fly in and do remote from Trevor's location with that fancy setup. No, I mean, I found out multiple reasons why it's wrong. It's just this area is very loud, and like I don't have a good soundproofing because it's all made of cement. So that's why. Yeah, you know, Dixon, I don't like stereotypes usually, but Puerto Rico being loud seems pretty on the nose. Bro, I, I live in the boonies. It's not. Puerto Rico is the island. It's like saying <clears throat> you go to like Kansas and you go to like the most ghetto place. That's literally where I live. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's all right. That's all right. Home's always home, though. But yeah, uh, yeah we, we got Trevor on today because we're going to do something a little different. We've actually I kind of looked back because I uh, I uploaded the podcast to YouTube. So the episodes will now automatically be sent there. And uh yeah, while I was kind of going back looking at some of the old episodes, I was like, oh, yeah, we did talk about that. And there have been a couple where we do talk about kind of new players, but I don't feel like we get too much into competitive play a lot of times. And and that's what we're going to talk about today. Just if you're a newer player and you have a lot of questions about, you know, what do you do in tournaments? How do I list build? You know, what do I think about for this situation versus that? That's kind of why we got Trevor on because he has a lot of questions and Dixon and I have a lot of tournament experience. So I figured it'd be good for a lot of people to kind of get that type of information. Yeah, I've I've been playing since about April. And as we're getting into this, you know, I I feel like I finally got past basic list building. And then <laughs> I have been hammering Pete with questions through text on you know, how do I go about this? And um, so I think that's kind of what led to this conversation here. Yeah, and I think that's kind of the most interesting step that people take when they're like, okay, I know how to play the game. I know my basic models. But now to be successful in a tournament, I need to figure out all this other crap. So that's kind of what we're going to be focusing on today. Uh, But before we get into that, make sure that you guys are checking us out. You can do that on our Discord channel. Uh, The link's kind of all over the place, especially in the... Um, in the show notes and then you can also check us out on youtube putting out a lot of content on youtube we got battle reports going up again uh, doing some live streams um, also just doing some general things like i said the podcast is getting uploaded to that if you like it um, on there and then uh, yeah you can also just check us out on things like twitter all that fancy stuff but if you want to support us directly, you can do that at patreon.com slash ragequitwire, where you can support us for as little as a dollar. You get the show early. You also get to have access to these live recordings, which is cool because we always get a couple patrons popping in, and they can ask questions about stuff like this while we're recording, and we usually answer them right on the episode. And then finally, if you want to also use our affiliation link, you can do that at give us your money, please, thank you, dash weird.com slash ragequitwire, and little bit of what you spend on weird store goes back to the podcast to get more junk to play and this is (laughs) i had uh beard minis who does uh don't touch the beard and does like a lot of uh streaming and stuff on fridays i believe he does he does live battle reports and he was like so why have you abandoned sand deep and why are you playing resers now and i'm like honestly dude it's for content like i realized we hadn't had a lot of Rezzer content, so I decided to buy stuff and play it because that's the way I learn it. So uh, 
yeah, that affiliation link helps that uh, cocaine, if you will. I just, matter of fact, I think I just spent 300 bucks on more Rezzer minis last night, so that was not good. Thanks for that, guys. Thanks for that. I, I sent Dixon <laughs> That's a not screenshot. not good for me either. <laughs> I don't know, Dixon. I didn't see anything too degenerate that I actually, never mind. I did buy like Von Stuck's alt box. Never mind. Yes. No, I, I, I mean, every single time I see any rest of stuff that you're buying, it hurts my soul. But like, yeah. Oh, uh, I tell you what, I did have to buy that stupid starter box with the guild stuff and Karai stuff in it because I needed the Gwisin. So I'm literally buying that box for like two models. I was going to say, doesn't that also come in with like uh, the, the mage, the guild mage? Yeah. Which, yeah. yeah. That's So I'm pretty much buying it, and I think I'll just put it in our tournament like giveaway raffle yeah. stuff. So maybe somebody will be able to appreciate it. That model uh, went from it's in every list to it's in 50% of the list, and it's still good. I hate that. I'm still going to see a guild mage every now and then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the nerf's good. It's more situational now, and it's the discard to heal is the model that discards now, so that's better because it's you're not able to just activate anything and then heal that model up. You have to activate the model that's like, oh, I'm in danger, you know? So it was a good change to it. I, I don't I don't hate it. It's still a solid model, which, you know, that's what it should be. Yep, yeah, that's one of the things I wanted to mention in this podcast. Just the guild mage? <laughs> No, no, just <laughs> models like him. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, let's kind of start getting into the topic of the day, which is looking at competitive play, uh, focusing in on the newer players. So uh, I know that some people play Malifaux for the kind of like story or the, you know, beer and pretzels. We're ha- talking about a narrative. It's all good and fun. Like people like Malifaux for that, but I feel like, the rules themselves do lend themselves to competitive play a little bit more. The gaining grounds is designed around competitive play. It gives you all the formats and stuff. So Trevor, did you get into the game just because it looked cool or did you anticipate competitive play? Like what, what were you thinking when you got into it? Well, you were talking about my professional setup here. I, I was streaming on Twitch for a while and uh, towards the end of pandemic, I just, I needed to get it out of the house and my wife wanted me to get out of the house. <laughs> and, uh, and I went to a local board game shop and somebody there basically had me run a henchman wh- hardcore. I ran the outcast starter set there, which was actually, it was a really good set for me to start with. Cause it's just guns, Yep, you know, it's just people running and shooting. And, um, I'm a huge board game player. Um, on the screen here, I've got a bunch of board games behind me. Uh, so I'm a huge competitive board game player and I've played a lot of tabletop games like D and D and stuff. But when I started looking at the cards and I'm like, okay, two actions, you know, one of those is a movement. You've got a bonus action here. And then you've got like counters and stuff like that, that you can do. And, um, it just, it pulled me in there because, I'm a huge competitive player. I used to play billiards, and now since I don't do that anymore, I've been kind of missing a competitive outlet in my life. Yeah. And once I started playing the 35 Soulstone game, then immediately I wanted the 50 Soulstone game. So once I played that, it, it just, I mean, I've been hooked pretty much since. I mean, you've seen me there probably at the game shop every week <laughs> since yeah, that time. And I think that's a good point that Malifaux, I have seen draw people from non competitive like things. Like I've seen guys that they played competitive poker and they played Malifaux and love it. Uh, you play billiards. I see people that do like competitive board games and RPGs, which I don't know how you get competitive with board games, but you know, <laughs> besides like just, yelling at people at your house when you know you don't collect your two hundred dollars at monopoly i don't know as, <laughs> but, as somebody with a giant history of dick measuring contests i can tell you right now anything can be competitive if you try hard true. enough i know that's true because i i yeah, want many a bet that way <laughs> that's like when your two-year-old has their little mini basketball hoop and they go for a layup and you just you know dikembe yeah. mutombo block their shot because oh, you don't give God. them anything easy I had so many problems when I was younger because of that. Because I just I I had that competitive bug and I didn't know how to turn it off. Yeah, so I mean, Malifaux is definitely good for that because the competitive scene is good. There's a lot of people that travel for events, um, and when you build up your local meta, you can get you know really good you know monthly, quarterly, 
you know, semi-annually tournaments, whatever you want to do. And that's kind of what we're doing in our area. We're starting to do it where hopefully we can get at least, you know, a quarterly tournament and try to draw some people from different areas. So it's Malifaux is a good game for that because you do have, and I, I don't know if you've played other games, Trevor, and you can talk to this a little bit, but there are some other games that when you try to play them competitively, the rules might be so, you know, loose and kind of fluffy or, you know, they're really kind of beer and pretzel games, but people try to make it a competitive game. And that leads to frustration because you can just lose to bad luck just really easily. So I don't know if you can talk about that with Malifaux that maybe you have a little more control that makes it more competitive. Right. Yeah, I, I would completely agree with that. So for me, I actually never played Warhammer or any of the, you know, I guess, war game type yeah. games before. Um, but I did... You know, I did try with another local person here. I tried the, uh, is it through the breach or no, the other side, the other side. side, yeah. the other side. Um, and I didn't quite get the same type of feel from it. Uh, there's also something about rather than it being a dice roll, you being able to choose the cards in your hand at what time that you want to choose them to make it more strategic and to have more control over that. Yeah. Um, so I thought that that was something that made it really interesting to me. Yeah, is the other side dice? No, it's cards. Okay. No, it's it's not. I'm just talking about being yeah, from general. from coming from a you know D and D yeah. and you know other tabletop RPG background. That was that's what I was gonna mention. Uh, the reason why I got into Malifaux over War Machine because I was a War Machine competitive player when Malifaux came out, and eventually I want to say like six or eight months later I became a Malifaux gamer. Is because before that, I was a Magic player when I was in my teenage years, and I used to play D&D. Well, I still play D&D, right? And those two game systems appear in Malifaux. Literally, Magic is the hand discipline and the combos, and then D&D is like a mix between the combos and the action economy. Like, okay, how many actions can I have, and how many, how many things can I do with just this limitation? Yeah, and I um, mean... In- you play a game like 40k and warhammer like they feel fun but when you go to play competitively i mean you're chucking like a hundred dice it's like (laughs) i can't i just can't anymore like i'm tired of picking out dice i'm tired of bad rolls i'm tired of my space marines dying to flashlights the thing is you spend when i used to play 40k competitively uh back in like 20 years 10 years ago um freaking the worst thing about 40k is like you spend hours on list building and yeah. then when you go into the table you only do priority targets that's it that's, yep. that's the most thinking that you do as priority targets and just hope that the dice don't fuck you <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's and, it that's literally and, the entire thing and you're building generalist lists right like you're building like one list to go into an event and just play that out and i feel like malifo it's more of a puzzle when it comes to list building because you're doing it on the fly. Like, yeah, you can have your list pre-built, but I feel like this is where newer players kind of struggle with, okay, they're playing this keyword. Do I bring my normal stuff or do I bring something else? And I think that's kind of the stage you're at, Trevor, where you're just trying to figure out how to do that. Yeah, it is. And and something that's helped me out a lot is when Pete and I determine that we're going to play, he sends me the code and I can kind of get prepared that way. Um, what I'm struggling with right now is I'm not going to know who the other person is playing until the actual game. And so <laughs> I'm getting a little nervous about it with the list building. Like, I feel like I've got a good solid list for my crews for the strategy and for the scheme pools like that. To me, I at least have my head wrapped around the game enough that that is easy enough for me to do. But then once I see a master, if I haven't encountered that master before, like, am I just scrambling to scroll through their (laughs) stuff as quick as I can before the game starts in the competition, like in a tournament? How much... I mean, how much time do you have? So that's that's what I was gonna get at when we were talking about the guild mage earlier. Uh, so talking to Harley, I realized that I do have certain things that just help exactly that problem. I simplify every keyword in my head. 
that way I don't have to spend, okay, so so this math here and this math here is like, no, no, it's more like, okay, if I think tormented, I think terrifying, I think card discard, they're going to discard my hand, and it's terrifying. Okay, so Corporal. I have to, <laughs> see, Pete, Pete already has the idea in his head, so he's like, okay, so I don't, I don't have to like look at stats too much, I just know, these are the things that I have to deal with, right? Do I have anything that, you know, deals with one of these uh, issues or multiple issues? Uh, in the case of the Guild Mage, things that I think are really good are, do I use a keyword that discards, or do they use a keyword that discards, and then Guild Mage happens. So those little things are, are you just try to simplify it, and then pick something that can just fix yeah, I mean, that I, issue. And there's some keywords that are more obvious than others, like, when, and I think of, is there something in this master that is going to just wreck me, so... And you don't even have to look at the keyword. You can usually just look at the master's card when they declare it. And then you can switch the title to the title and be like, okay, these both kind of do this thing. Looks like some armor. looks like some of this. And, you know, he's creating terrain, whatever the case is. And then I usually go, okay, in keyword, do I have something to deal with that? So before you even think of out of keyword or versatiles, I go, okay, in keyword. Okay, I do have an answer for that. Okay, I can just bring one of my normal lists. And that's kind of my counter process is just like, okay, I don't have anything in keyword. Is that really going to be a problem for me? No. Okay. I can probably just work around it. Or is it going to be a problem? Yeah. I need a tech for that. Bring a model. Um, but I talked with, I can't remember who it was. I was talking with somebody and we had the same idea that you can tech pick for things, but it should also do something with your crew. Like, don't just bring something because it's anti-armor. It should be anti-armor and it does something with your crew or and it's going to help you score, you know, victory points. So you kind of want to keep that in mind when you're starting to think about what the master does when they declare it. That I want to point out to, that's the main reason why I absolutely love Klaus when I'm playing Neverborn. Because Klaus denies most of that most of the things that you just mentioned because he's friendly to you and just randomly like for example when i was playing against you yesterday with tall if uh say you were playing neverborn and you brought uh tall i mean uh klaus klaus i would not be able to hurt him with like 50 percent of the things that i was doing yeah. to you i couldn't push him i couldn't trigger on him like Blast, uh, blast yeah, is the only thing I can Trevor do. appreciates that because Klaus has infiltrator or whatever it is, Trevor. So you have that with yeah. your operatives. Yeah, that's kind of what I figured out was that I've been playing Explorer Society. And essentially I, what I've been doing is I've been building a keyword and I first play a few games with just in keywords. So I get used to the models and then I start swapping in some versatile and stuff like that. But when I started playing your resers, uh, it especially came in play with terrifying that having those operatives in there is is huge oh, yeah. um and another resource i've had recently is i have been going on the weird discord and hopping in the explore society chat yep and i throw a question in there and you get great feedback yep. um in in the faction specific discords in there oh yeah yeah uh the, one of the models by the way i don't know if pete already told you and this is a, a, a thing that i recommend to anybody that plays explorers there's two models botanist which i'm pretty sure Pure already mentioned, and Jin Baccarat. Those two models are going to come out. <laughs> Pete, why Why do you hate Jin? I just, you, you say it. I mean, Jin just it. gives you a pass token. He's just sitting there buried like a jerk. And then he also just pops out and sends one of your minions to your deployment zone. And oh yeah, by the way, he has armor piercing, so that's great. Yes. Yeah, and to top it all off, his action while he's buried is, is actually really good. Yeah, Trevor, don't buy that model. You'll hate it. It's not good. <laughs> not a good model. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I my, mean, Pete's going to get to see some botanists later today, I think. So. <laughs> That's excellent. Because, like, it, it's just little things that improve your play style and simplify your problems. Because you got, okay, right. I got this big problem. How can I simplify this so it's not that bad? And that's it. That's all you try to do every time. So, getting back to in the competition. So, once your master is chosen, um, and like I said, I'm immediately trying to react to that. Is Are you building the list on time, like while it's timed, or does the time start after? There's usually a built-in like 10 minutes like before the round starts time. Yep. 
So usually that's okay. for list building. That's for getting your crap out, you know, deployment, scheme picking, all that stuff. Yeah. Okay. Very tight on time. Uh, I think we had two hours, two and a half hours for the entirety yeah. of, of our round. Uh, yeah, and I, I will say that you, when I started playing competitively, I generally had lists that were pre-built, and then I usually just picked those lists that I thought best went into the matchup. Um, now, when I when somebody declares a master, if I feel like I need to counter something, I actually just build a new list on the fly. I just like, okay, here's my mm. you know always bring models. I want these upgrades, and then here's my tech picks. I feel like I'm this close to that point, but I'm just not quite there yet. Yeah. So I do have a bunch of pre built that I'm probably going to be using for this. And then if I see something, I might try try to swap one or two models out to tr- try to react to what, what that might be. And that's the good thing about Malifaux, though, is that you do get the pools usually like a, a week or two before the event. So you mm-hmm. can kind of play them out and build lists that go generally good with it. Oh, have you started doing modules uh, at all in your list building? Do you know what a module is? No. All right, so module is basically... Okay, do I. The... I don't know what he's talking about. No, you do. <laughs> you just probably call it something different. It's when you have two to two or more models that when grouped together, they can go off on their own and do oh, their sure. own thing. Yeah. yeah. You... Oh, yeah. I Actually, I have been doing that where yeah. I'm like, okay, these guys can go do something. These guys can go. Do, like, so yes. I like I did that the other day where I had three little parties that could go and do their That's things. Perfect, you know? because that is the number one way that you actually start doing uh, uh, edits to your list. It's like, okay, you go into a matchup and you go, oh, it's such and such. Well, I hmm. can drop this module to put in this other stuff that I need. And that's it. You, you start removing, uh, like, for example, um, Titania, because I play Titania against Pete a lot. Uh, I don't really have any space other than maybe the Mouseros Rex or the Emissary. So that's a really bad list for adaption. So if something goes wrong and they pick a master that somehow destroys that list, I'm forced to, like, go into the title. So that's a bad type of mentality right but then if i'm playing say pandora i've made like eight different lists against pete because all of the models are modules except for candy candy's like the only model that doesn't get out of the list so that's more adaptable so that's the type of stuff that you should be looking into it's like okay so what can i actually take out of the list and it's it's Mm -hmm. the master still working after that that's in, that's interesting to me that you said that because like the next thing I have written down here are there some keywords that the master is the only decent model where you're going to be doing a lot of out of keyword because not saying that EVS is like that because there's a lot of power in some of the things that EVS has because I've been just starting to play with Maxine but I have noticed that her core keyword list is not as strong as the syndicate when they work together. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what we call, like, there's a couple words for that. It's either called, like, an all-star list or, like, the good stuff list. So, for example, we were talking with Maniacal Cackle about Rezzers last week, which he'll be back on. He just uh, wasn't feeling good this week, so that's why we scheduled something different. But he was talking about McMorning 2 specifically last week, and he was like, if I think somebody is a really bad matchup for his keyword because they like get around poison or they clear out poison or something like that, he'll switch for basically McMorning 2 to be like maybe one or two models in keyword and the rest of it's just like, hey, just bring the good stuff. So, you know, for Rezzers, that would be like Dead Rider, Archie, Manos, you know, Enslaved Spirits, Gwissens, and then you maybe have one or two actual experimental models. So you can do that where it's like, I play Maxine, I bring Calypso, and then everything else is out of keyword. So you can definitely do that, and you can make it where it fits to scoring. And like we said, just put in your little modules of, yeah, I'm doing out of keyword, but these two out of keyword models work together, and these other two yeah. work together. Yeah, uh, Cackle, actually, uh, there was a, a good span of, like, I think it was eight months that the only three models that were, like, keyword were Archie, one of the Krulligans, yeah. and, oh, I guess... 
four models. So it was Master, Totem, Archie, and Akruligan. And everything else was just Yeah, everything out of else keyword. is out of keyword, yep. Yeah, yeah. And he did it for like eight months, maybe a year. And he, I think that was the year that he won World Champion, too. So, like, it's doable to be out of keyword. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, I, I, I brought that up because I'm going to be playing somebody else. And we did our matchup, and it's me and Maxine. And I already chose Maxine versus Terra. Yeah. And then automatically Calypso is done for me. Yes. You know? Yep. Uh, I, and, and then I was thinking, okay, well, you can Calypso still, was you can, like my you can one still solid bring, bottle. You can still bring Calypso. <laughs> I just wouldn't bring BB. Why would you bring, bring Calypso BB? Okay. without BB, yeah. though? Because I like yeah. the tentacles? I don't know. That's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> he still does stuff yeah, by himself. No. <laughs> but I thought that was interesting. I was like, okay, well, now I'm set with this master. Yep. Mm-hmm. And my one main model that I've been using, granted, I've only played a few times so far um, with Maxine. So I mean, you do have a very good swap, which is Kia. Mm-hmm. So you, you can actually do that, or if you're playing Kia, that you can have the tide caller. So like, it's yep. always because it's eight points, if I remember correctly. Tide caller is eight. Kia is ten. Ten. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um. Uh, when they're together, they're ten. Yeah. And Calypso on his own without BB in there is six. So okay, so yeah, so it's ten points for the for the module for Calypso. So therefore, you swap out and put Kia or Tight Color, and you gain some yep. points. So that that's that works out perfectly, unless you somehow yep. with all four models on the same list. I doubt. Right. <laughs> um. The next section I had for a question here was playing to react versus playing your own game. I noticed one of the things I was doing as a newer player was I was reacting to every move that my opponent was making. And I only just recently realized that that playing that way was just not the right way to play. Like (laughs) I need to play my own game. And if there's something that I need to address, right. Then I should go after it. I mean, is that uh, it's like a mix tracking? of both? Because or... like yesterday, yeah. <laughs> again, we'll use game, yesterday's game because it's just so fresh in my mind. Because I thought I was losing for like half the game, <laughs> and I think it was like at the end of turn three we realized that I was winning by two points, and there was like very little peak could have done. And I was reacting and being proactive. Like, I think one of the activations I activate, we're going to have, it's going to be a video on YouTube, so you're going to be able to see it. But I activated Loisa first because I, I understood the assignment. I knew if I don't activate Loisa now and set up my points right now, I'm not going to have a mm-hmm. So I literally activated her, set up my points, and ran away, and she almost died anyway. So oh, imagine. She did, she did die. No, she died a turn later. Remember? Yeah, because you flipped a red joker on initiative, you jerk. <laughs> That's right. No, but you, you see what I mean by this. Like, you can play your outs, and sometimes you just have to be lucky. And, it, like, I just, the entire game, I was just like, okay, I need to get my points because I can't fight Pete. So I'm going to have to, like, wait, react to what he does, and then be proactive. So because the thing that, is, like, you that, can't, you I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, that's kind of the thing that, as a newer player, I think it's hard. And even not a newer player, even if you're kind of like an aggressive player just in nature. I feel like if if you have somebody who throws a model and like punches you, it's your natural instinct to be like, well, I'm going to activate that model and hit you back. But you got to kind of pause there for a second and be like, okay, do I really need to activate this model right now? Because is that's it, what, yeah. Is there I a really follow up coming? To, like, is, yeah. are they going to kill it? But and if the yeah. answer is no, it's like, okay, well, I can leave this there for now. And, yep. you know, maybe you can pull it out of there because you need to think yeah. if they throw a model in your face, they want you engaged with that model and, and bogged down. So you, chances are you probably want to actually get out of there and go do something useful. Yep. Right. Yep. Like, giving well, up a model then, is also a thing. Sometimes this model's going to die. You know it's going to die. So start thinking about something else. Right. So, so like, denying points. Like, if, if denying points is easier, is that the better option rather than really trying to go and get your scheme or your... I mean, obviously, you want to try to score your strategy every turn, but... I think that's if, more play style. 
Mm -hmm. Because some people lean into the denial game more. Uh, whereas a lot of times I'm just planning on getting my eight points. And if I deny some of your points, that's how I win the game. So I think the easiest thing is to tr try and deny the strategy first. So if you can focus on that, that's kind of where I first start with denial. And then I try to play the guessing game. So I thank God that I, because I said that to, to Harley, I was like, that, that that's how you play. Uh, the way I play? Like, yeah, that, what you yep. just described is how you play. Uh, I Because you like to score your points early and then start slowly start denying me points. Because you, you just go turn three or turn two, I got my schemes, like the first point. And then the rest of the turn, you just like, no points for you, no points for you, no points for you. Yep. Uh, but what I was going to say is, I, when I was talking to him, I think I, we figured out four different types of play styles. There's a mentality that I had, which was, if you kill them all... They can't score points. <laughs> and that's just what That's <laughs> true. For real. I like, am from some of the podcasts that I've listened to, uh, which I've listened to quite a bit now mm -hmm. uh, of you guys. <laughs> Dixon, I kind of got that <laughs> yeah. from, <laughs> I, I, it's, from the way that you play. It's for like locking people in the deployment zone. Which literally mm -hmm. yeah. people like the play Dixon plays the fastball special and just, you know, oh, throw, yeah. throws Wolverine into the fray. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so... It works for a lot of games because most people get shocked and go, whoa, and then they just try to fight in their deployment zone. But if you're in the deployment zone, you can't score, right? Uh, so are you still doing that into this GG too? Uh, every now and then. Uh, mm -hmm. But it, it's not very efficient. I have to play differently. Like like I said, yesterday when I played against Speed, I did not do that. Mm -hmm. I tried to score points. I tried to basically replicate Pete. I tried to score points early and then try to deny as much as I could. And it worked, uh, but I, I'm i not proficient enough to realize that I was winning. So I I thought I was losing. And then, yeah, and then like end of turn three, we're like, oh, I'm going to win by literally just, you know, putting a couple more ski markers and I'm done. Yeah, and I, right. I think denying the strategy is definitely more powerful than denying schemes because... Once you miss it, you don't get to get it back on the strategy, right? You have to score it every turn. Otherwise, you miss those points. So oh, if, that's true. if you can deny them the strat on turn two, they can't get that point back. And that's when you start winning games. That's what I try to do early is I try to score my strat and deny their strat being scored. And then right. usually schemes, I'll let my opponent usually get the schemes first point down. But once I see what the scheme is, then I work denying the second point of the scheme. That actually leads me into my next question <laughs> was running out of time and end of game points. I, you know, in in the game of Malifaux, when you're just playing with your local meta, um, you just often don't finish games. People have to go home. Um, you know, you can kind of call the game. So end of game points are something I don't feel like I had a lot, have a lot of experience with yet because we just kind of determine who's going to win and we call the game, right? Yeah. So if you, you know, like if you run out of time or you can tell that you're going to run out of time, is it best to just try to drop those ski markers and get that stuff out there? Because then you can just sit and wait and hope. Yeah. That, that actually, it happens. Okay. So, so both of you are, uh, I'm assuming Pete also, because you've never heard anything about Malifaux before M3, right? Yeah. Yeah. So this was a, a tried and true tournament uh strategy was literally get your schemes on turn two and then stall i am not joking there were people that literally would slope like crap out of you by doing the strategy in one because of exactly what you're saying so that was in in to a level it still works but because of clocks it's not anymore once you introduce clocks to a, a any scene tournament or casual it fixes that problem People can actually finish games. Yeah, the and number I, I one will way, say... Uh, sorry, to, go to ahead, finish Jim. up real quick. Hey, just to finish up. The number one way that actually you get to play the clock better, Ambrose actually, uh, I think it's quoted on this, is help each other out. If you actually work together, like you actually say intent, you, you speed up your game by like, I want to say like four times. Yeah, I think clocks are definitely... Because even... Like, I played against somebody in our local meta, and, you know, he's not the most competitive. He's he's a solid player. Like, he's getting better. 
And I was like, hey, are you cool if we play on clock? He's like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to, you know, lose all my time. And I was like, that's fine. We'll keep playing if we run out of time. But I just want to get it mechanically used to that because of a, an event coming up. And I'll tell you what, I mean, it, he played pretty quick. He, he ran out of time, but we were, I think, halfway into turn four before he ran out of time. So he was playing at a decent pace. And getting to turn five is a big deal. And what I would tell people when – and because I think Dixon and I do this, but it's a little different because Dixon and I can look at a game and kind of know where it's going when we're playing. And there's a lot of times just because we're like, oh, you know, we kind of know how it's going to finish out. Let's just kind of hash it out. Yep. And – I it's basically Dixon and I aren't going to get anything else out of the game because we already know how cleanup goes. Whereas when you are in a tournament, obviously you have to do it. And then when you're a newer player, you don't have that knowledge to see the game as it plays out. So what I would say is if you're newer getting into competitive and if somebody wants to finish the game or sorry, wants to close the game out early, I I would have no problem if my opponent was like, Hey, can we actually finish this to turn five? Cause I want to, you know, you know, see how that would pan out and how we would end the game. And if they have time, I would say that's most people don't have a problem with that. But if you're finding like it's taking you too long to play a game, I would try playing it on the clock just because that'll help keep both of you moving at a better pace, even if you're not perfect with it. So that's kind of what I've, I've generally done. Okay. Yeah. Just, I, I'm just thinking about if I get to, you know, I'm running out of my time on turn four and I might not get a turn five, just like what my strategy of actions should be trying to hit. Yep, just I mean, put them down and hope the score. And, <laughs> yeah. 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 Drop, just, just start dropping scheme markers. If there's information overload, just. Uh, actually, that, that, that was what I was going to say. Pete yesterday mentioned it to me. I forgot what it was, but it, thank you. Information overload. Uh, there are schemes that dropping a scheme marker on the table randomly for no reason actually denies your opponent so you just want to do it just scheme yeah marker <laughs> no reason <Scheme> yeah <laughs> yeah there's a lot of bluffing in this gg as well because like we had outflank in the pool and then uh power ritual in the pool so it would be very easy dixon's like i'm gonna put this in my deployment zone for no reason and mm-hmm. you know he had power ritual but you know you can also bluff it and be like yeah i might have power ritual and it's not going to cost me anything besides a quick action yep yep also it was a model that literally was going to stay in my deployment zone yep yeah and yeah i i just like i did it i was like there's no reason for me to do this right drop a ski marker <laughs> since uh syndicate are such good schemers i've been thinking about that a lot just like the amount that i could fake out that i'm trying to get one and i'm actually going for the other yep um i've been thinking that quite a bit one of the things that infuriates me the most is the drudges in this gg because drudges can literally just carry ski markers to all the corners of the world and they're they're almost worthless models to kill. Yeah. So you like, yeah. you have a drudge in the middle of like, say your deployment zone, say you're playing standard. Uh, and then he can just walk to corners and then nobody, mm-hmm. like if you don't stop him, <laughs> it's like. They're just dragging that ski marker along <laughs> with them so and you can't remove it because they've got that ability where yeah. you can't, you can't remove it. And you um, have to yeah, kill it's it. Yeah. Pretty like, big. I, it's so frustrating, but it's one of those mm-hmm. strategies that, like, if you are an opponent and you're playing against Anya and you um, don't respect, you're going to lose. You're just going to lose. <laughs> yep. They're little throwaway models for me. I just use them and then they die and then I get another one. And <laughs> just Nobody keep cares. Cycling. Are, yeah. are you getting better, Trevor, at, rem- like, remembering abilities and stuff in-game? Because I know there was a game we played a while ago where you forgot Anya had that aura that she puts out where your opponent's scheme markers don't count for schemes so are you getting better at remembering that kind of stuff i'm trying to the, one of the things that i've been doing is i've got this little notepad here and i've been writing down things to remember about this keyword <laughs> yes I, because i just i'm somebody that has to write everything down and so i like have written that on my strategy that i've kind of written out um because that's how much I'm getting into this game is because now I'm sitting uh, writing strategy and things like that. But uh, I've been having that next to me when I'm playing like, oh, yeah, she's got that aura. So I'm getting better about it. But I honestly think there's since there's so much going on with each keyword, 
it's just something you kind of have to start making and now, uh, like just memory for like is, our, uh, yeah. you know. No, Trevor, this is a thing that we actually say a lot. This is what I call muscle memory. Yep. This what mm, Muscle memory. That's what I was looking for. This yep. is what I call muscle memory because you do it with like, so much repetition. Like, you mm-hmm. force yourself to remember. And the best way to learn it, and I know this is going to sound stupid, is whenever something bad happens, try not to take it back because let that pain remind <laughs> you. Let it let it mm. sit there and yeah. stew. It does. It a thousand percent. It does, works. Seamus. Yeah, I was like, nope, I'm gonna take this. Trevor didn't believe me when I said Seamus has a big gun. <laughs> oh, nobody does. Nobody does until it gets shot in the face by it. I remember that, there was a, that there was a game that I played. Uh, somebody was saying Angelica was good, and I played, and I was like, "Are you sure? Because I'm pretty sure I can kill her." And he, I got, I got unlucky, and I didn't have enough severes in my hand, so I only did six damage to her. Uh. yeah, hmm. but like that's the type of thing you're like, ah, oh, well, I guess I don't have the cards. <laughs> so I think I remember the stuff that the bad people do to me more yeah. <laughs> than the stuff that I can do to them, because? which is, uh, you know, I mean, it's kind of good because then if I see that master again, I can be like, oh, okay, these guys just drop pyro markers all over the place. I got to think about a way to counteract that. Yeah. You know. No, no, but I want to point out again. You remember it because it hurts. Yes. <laughs> it's true. true. It's 100%. Yeah. You want to get good with muscle memory. When you get frustrated, try to push through. Because well, that and, yeah. and that's like with uh, that's like with Molly. I mean, I'm still getting used to Molly's ability where it's like if you do the same action, you take two damage. So I'm just now getting into a spot where I'm paying attention to my opponents enough to monitor that while I'm game planning as well. So anytime you play a new keyword, it takes a while for you to remember, especially auras, because auras are just always up. So I feel like if you have a keyword that has a lot of auras, that takes more muscle memory for you to remember um, (laughs) what's up and what's active. The replayability of this game is it's incredible oh, for yeah. me because I I I feel like I've been playing the same keyword. I've been playing Syndicate for three plus months now, and I'm still learning stuff that I can combo and do with them. Yep. You know. Absolutely, because like you like remember the modules that we were talking about. After the modules, you start uh, adding layering, and it just it gets a completely new game. You're like, wait, I can layer these defenses, or I can layer these attacks. Or these, you know, in your case, it's like, how can I drop a ski marker, make a drudge, move the model, and score a point? Yeah, you start figuring out synergies a little better, Mm -hmm. too. Correct. So, uh, I've got two more questions, if if we got time for it. Oh, yeah, Um, we got time. uh, So, are there usually rules, like refs, that kind of walk around to determine if there's a conflict between a rule between two parties? Yes. That'll determine it outside of the players. <laughs> yeah, you just call judge. Yeah, there's, okay. a, there's a TO. You don't have to be like Magic the Gathering and yell for a judge across the room. But, you know, it's... <laughs> <laughs> judge! That's uh, the... Yeah. Oh, that happened to me at the finals in fucking Gen Con. Literally, yeah. we're playing, and I said something about like, oh, it's only one card, and my opponent literally yelled exactly how you. He was like, judge! And your mother was a hamster, and... <laughs> <laughs> It's like, whoa, what Does happened? the time get paused? <laughs> the, TO, the TO can pause it if they're kind of like, you know, um, if they're mentioning or if they need to kind of rule on it and get the whole situation. But generally speaking, Malifo, you usually, you know, figure it out between you, you and yourself or you and your opponent. And then if there's some, I always say if there's something that doesn't sound right, like if you read their ability or if you look at the situation, you're like, ah, I don't think that's the way that works. Instead of just letting that go and be like, well, they're probably right. I always just call a TO over and, and ask them if that's how it works. There was a, there was one of my first big tournaments that I was in and I played against, uh, who was it? I think it was actually Zoraida. I think he activated the wicked doll, did something. I killed the wicked doll and then he activated Zoraida and resummoned the wicked doll and I was like, can you activate the Wicked Doll again? He's like, yeah. I was like, ah, that doesn't sound right. So I actually asked the TO, and they're like, yeah, you totally can do that. Yep. So even though mm-hmm. you, you you might not be right or you think that, you know, I'm asking a stupid question, it's always worth getting a neutral opinion in a tournament. 
And actually, yeah. that is not a stupid question because of what I'm about to say next. So all the newer players, the key difference between uh, what Pete is talking about, because that actually happens, is replace and summon. So Raida summons, and, but yeah. there are other effects in the games that replace. When and you, you, replace, can't, you can't reactivate a replace model. That's right. Cause, uh, right. Yeah. Yeah, a replace model is Unless you're the, the duet. Way. The duet gets around that a little bit. <laughs> yeah, they they specifically made a rule. Trevor loves the, the Corfi duet. Yeah, for the Corfi duet to actually have I, the watch. You know what? I've, I'm glad that I've gotten to experience them a few times, though, because then I, I, can, I know. Yeah. But I can still handle Listen, them if I need to, my, I guess. But. My meta gets lots of different <laughs> keywords and factions because I I think, Trevor, you were talking. You're like, yeah, because didn't you play like Guild and then Bayou and then Arcanist and now you're doing Rezzers? And, uh. Yeah, no, but like that's the awesome thing about playing against Pete. It's like it's it, life is a box of chocolates. You'll never, never know, know what, what you're going to get. get. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I, I I thought that in an actual tournament, you will most likely have people that really want to get that figured out, yeah. rather than when you're playing in your local meta, you could you just kind of like, well, that's how I interpret it. That's how I interpret it. You yes. agree, you move forward. But people might get a little bit more concerned about certain things in the tournament. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I very. I think I had a total of six judge calls in the tournament. So you. Trust me. And again, the Lone Star fall down. And four of those were in the same game. So it happens. You just have to get used to it. You literally mm-hmm. just have to get used to it. To, to, you have a doubt, call the judge. Yep. Um, what are the most common downfalls that you see in new players to tournaments? Analysis paralysis. Uh, 100%. Getting, getting stuck. Yeah, number one analysis paralysis. Number two, uh, hand discipline. Yeah, so the analysis paralysis, I think when you just kind of sit there and you're trying to find the best move, and I, I kind of learned this from the military, so I, I didn't have this issue a lot when I first started playing because having no move is better is just bad. So you, you want to do something, and it might not be the most optimal play, but doing something and moving towards some kind of idea to victory is the best path, even if it's not the best way to get there. Like so, take a move and play it yeah. rather than th- just stew on it because yeah. of time. Yeah, because right? it, because you got to think, if you actually do stuff and you, you get into the game deeper, you're going to have more plays to kind of reach back and be like, okay, this this play worked. I tried this in this game. That one didn't work, so I don't want to try that one. And that's kind of that muscle memory that we talk about where it's like, you know, I tried this one time and it went bad, so I don't want to do that. And I was doing that yesterday against Dixon, not to spoil the battle report, but I was literally playing because I got a lot of games with Manos because he's good out of keyword. And I was looking at this gun line that Dixon had. I was like, (laughs) I can't go that way. And I looked the other way and I was like, well, if I go that way, I can, but then I'm not doing anything to score victory points. So what do I do here? So I was like, I think I just dive through the middle and just had, through the no, no, stray no. of bullets and just try to get points. <laughs> no, no, you you uh, use the terrain in your favor. That's what it was. Because the thing is, a lot of the, the stuff that new players are, are analysis paralysis about is that they don't simplify that, oh, I'm facing a gun line, okay, I don't want to be seen. That's yeah, it. but and if Toll doesn't need to see you is the problem. <laughs> in your case, there were four guns that ignored line of sight, but the other four did not ignore line of sight. So you still did the smart thing by like hiding behind a wall. I agree with Spire that Manos needs stealth. <laughs> uh, no. He doesn't need any more than he's got. Uh, but so I ended up just diving <laughs> through the middle of the board. I hid behind a wall. I leapt into the strategy marker, got my VP for that. And then next turn first activated and dove into the corner of a building huddled. It, it yep. almost felt like a World War One, you know, moment where I'm just huddled <laughs> in a trench while bombardment's coming yes. down. Because before he brutal. activated on turn two, I think he was at three life. Yeah. Luckily, yeah. as regen, so, you know, that helped him. But, yeah, th- just there's a lot of indirect fire, which is cool about Tull. That fits into his keyword. Yep. Um, oh, but, uh, and a uh, quick uh, uh, bonus, I guess. If you're playing Tull... Uh, one, remember, put your artillery markers right next to the raids. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. He's good vaults, in raid stash. 
or read a book. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's kind of an example of I could have sat there and tried to find an optimal play, but I just quickly was like, okay, I can't go left. I can't go right. You know, I think you you kind of have to make peace that just sometimes things die. And Manos is an expensive, good piece. So it was hard for me to be like, he's going to die. But I was like, okay, he's going to die, but he can get me three victory points here. And that's probably worth it even if he dies. He only got me two, but he almost got me three. But I, I failed to recognize that Dixon's cannons could clear out ski markers. So that made me sad. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he, he does a lot of work, though. He just does a lot of work. Oh, yeah. he, he tried. Uh, the thing that did the most work were the hang, by far. And I was not expecting that out of a, uh, whatchamacallit, a... Uh, uh, Yan Lo crew. That was mm-hmm. super gross. Like, he showed me the list and everything, and I was like, oh, this is going to be gross, but I want to see it. Yeah. And then the hang did way more work than I expected. <laughs> yeah, I definitely – and I, I learned a lot that they could have even done more. So – and that's just like I said, what I said. You know, sometimes when – especially if you play a newer model, you don't know everything it does. So just test something out. Just be like, all right, I'm going to, you know, attack here, see what it does. I'm going to scheme mm-hmm. there. And just kind of see how I can get victory points and what I can kill. Um, so, yeah, just not not getting stuck there and just kind of sitting like, what can I do? Just be like, okay, I can do 20 things, but I'm going to do this one thing and we'll see how it goes. If you, if you like, encounter a master that you've never played, I mean, because there, there's just so many out there yeah. that I'm not going to spend my time pouring over yeah, and you're not gonna the get a cards game and the masters of each keyword. Like, okay, I need to look out for this if they choose that. Like, I don't want to get in my head that far, right? Yeah, and that's, like, that's why it's good to get general ideas about the keywords. So, honestly, a lot of, like, podcasts and, and content – um, is just, that's why I like listening to podcasts because sometimes you'll, you'll listen to a, like a deep dive or you listen to somebody who has a battle report and, um, you'll just kind of learn generally what the crew does. And then once you see it, like that helps you kind of prepare for it and at least play it where you can win and not mm-hmm. just get totally surprised. Like if, like you played against Jack Daw for the first time, and I'm sure you were just like, "This sucks." <laughs> <laughs> it did suck. <laughs> yeah, and I just realized you just don't want to get close. And yeah, I mean, a lot of just the local meta stuff. I'm I'm okay going in blind because then I will remember that. Yeah. Like I played, it was Toll that you guys were just talking about. He drops the little artillery yeah. markers, and you can't end your turn within a certain distance of those kind of deal. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm learning that way by organically playing others, but I, uh, you're right. Listening to podcasts, like I've listened to your guys's podcast. Um, I listened through kind of each faction where you did the, this and GG three, yeah. this, you know, so I li- just to see if I could hear a couple of masters pop up that they're talking about and they talk about the mechanics of, of that. Also, of what, what would be good for you to do as well? Is when I get into, and I, this doesn't happen anymore because obviously I, I know generally what most masters do. Um, so I don't ask this anymore just because I have, you know, I've been playing this game for a while for, you know, the last three and a half, four years, whatever. But mm. I think something good for newer players to do is when you see what master they declare in a tournament, just sit there for a second and just be like, you know, talk to your opponent and say, okay, what does Jack Daw do? Like, what are some things that, you know, his keyword does? And they're not going to give you, like, the whole, like, this is my killer combo, but they'll tell you generally, right. like, oh, yeah, Jack Daw has a lot of terrifying. He's in Corporal. He attacks your movement. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they'll give you a quick, at least most people, will give you a quick rundown of kind of what their keyword generally does. And then that can give you some ideas on how you want to move forward in a game that you aren't as familiar with the master. Right. Well, and you've always been very good about that, where at the beginning, and everybody in my local meta, really, um, just where at the beginning, I just ask, well, what, you know, what does your master do? I just wasn't sure if people would be a bit more tight lipped when it comes to tournaments nah. and things like that, or if that's not, I don't know. No, most, I mean, most everybody I've played will, with has been, some friendly, people will give so. you more information. Um, like I give a general breakdown. I don't, you know, sit there and like spell out everything. But some people I've asked, like, oh, yeah, what does this do? And they'll be like, well, this one model will do that. This one model will do that. And they'll give you, like, a detailed. Um, But, yeah, most people will just say, yeah, you know, if you're playing against Maw, she has Scamper. So if you cheat, this happens. And, you know, blah, blah, blah. So 
it is just it's a good way. Most people in tournaments, I actually, I, I would say, I've never had anybody in tournament who didn't answer that question. You know, it's just not that type of game. It's interesting with the GG4 going into place, like. All of your conversations on your podcast and the stuff, you know, which masters are good and which GG and everything like that. It, it's so interesting that that changes because all of that information that was relevant, oh, these are the masters to look out for in this faction for this GG. Now everybody's figuring that out all over again, which yeah, yeah, and I think is I, cool. Yeah, I think Spyro's question is definitely interesting where – asking how much damage does a specific model do or what's the threat range. I think those questions are also good. Like when you sit there and you ask like, okay, here is, you know, a hanged model. Okay. Well, how much damage does that model actually do? What's the threat range? Um, And, you know, they're not going to give you the total. Like if I go, okay, well this, this model can, you know, by itself threaten like 10 inches. I'm not going to sit there and also tell you like, oh, but I can toss it at 10, you know, 10 inches as well. Um, you know, so there's right. way to extend threats, but I give general threat ranges. I don't, I don't spell out combos when people ask like threat ranges. I just go, that model can go that far. And that's kind of where I'll leave it unless they ask like, oh, well, you know, what does toss do? Or, you know, could you toss that model? I'll be like, yeah, I can toss that model. I'll usually say I can get it 10 inches and there's ways I can extend that. So, <laughs> yeah. But the good news about Malifo is usually if I toss a model, you then have an activation to react to that, right? So you could be like, mm-hmm. okay, he just tossed it 10 inches and now there's a 10 inch threat on top of that. So I need to react to it. So that's kind of why I like Malifo is because even when they do a combo like that, usually there's an activation for you to react to it. Yeah. I mean, the toss action, I am I guess this is another question going into a tournament. When you're looking at people's stats um, and you're kind of browsing through your opponent's cards and what their higher stats are, I mean, it, I, I'm still trying to balance, okay, like these guys I'm going to go after their willpower because their stats are lower for willpower um, or versus defense. I mean... Is that just, again, something that comes a little bit more with with time as to figuring out stat four, stat five, stat six, what's worth your stat going against theirs? So um, usually the way I attack that is I was playing against another local, um, and he was playing Maw Tucket, I was playing Molly, and we were playing Plant Explosive, so... He actually did a good job of killing some of my models where I lost my plant or my explosive tokens like early. So I actually was in a situation where I had to kill models to get tokens back to then score later in the game. So I had to sit there and be like, okay, I need to get some of these tokens back. What can I kill to get those back? So I actually looked at the test subjects because some of them landed on a test subject. And I was like, okay, that's my easiest model to get those back. What's the Mm -hmm. easiest way to kill a test subject? Okay, they have armor. They have kind of crap stats until they get injured. So I was like, oh, I can just kill this with Molly because she does irreducible damage. And I have a stat six against their like stat two willpower. So I was like, that's the easiest way to kill that model. So yeah, you want to look for weaknesses. But honestly, if it's not going to score you points or delay your opponent from scoring points the weakness doesn't really matter. Like, okay, I can kill that model, but is it going to get me anything in the long run besides just removing it? Yeah. I I mean, finding the right models for me too, for being aggressive when you need to be aggressive. Um, that's something that I've struggled with a little bit. I've just had some trepidation putting a model out there because every time I feel like a model is out on its own, I feel like it gets picked off, but that could be some of the keywords that I've been playing and some of the models I've been playing. Like as, as soon as I introduced the e- intrepid emissary, yeah. um, that kind ki- that confidence just kind of came with that model instead where I know that, Hey, I can send this guy after somebody and he's, gonna generally be okay (laughs) you know yeah i mean removing a model is never bad unless it's a like if somebody has a crap model that got summoned a lot of times that's not a good thing to waste ap on because 
in this edition, you need a lot of action economy to score your points because it's a lot of scheming, right? So a lot of your points isn't coming from actually killing models. You can deny, but I find if you just kill crap, you're going to then be lacking on having actions left to score your points if you have to interact, if you have to you know, drop scheme markers and all this. So mm-hmm. removing models is good when it's there. Like if it's there and you don't need to score at that moment, yeah, just take it, just remove the model. Mm-hmm. But if if you're trying to score as well and it's like, well, I can kill this model, but I also need to drop two scheme markers this turn, where's that coming from? That's where you kind of need to start parsing that out and figuring out, okay, how am I actually going to do this effectively, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I'm still I'm still balancing the win to kill a model, especially now that we switch GGs, and it could be my keywords too. You know, Syndicate is really schemey. There, there's not a lot of. I mean, there's a few. Anya one and Sovereign combined can can take out somebody for sure. They've got some yeah. some attacks, but until yeah, until I introduced that Missouri, I I just didn't feel like I had that. So something else I would think about kind of getting into actual competitive play is um, just looking at has the model activated yet? Because you can kill a model, but a lot of times if you can kill a model before it activated, that's actually way more powerful because then it puts you up on activations. So that's actually something I'm going to write down right now <laughs> because <laughs> for exa- really good advice. <laughs> for example, Dixon activated Louisa and after he activated her, I was like, okay, I mean, I can kill her, but I don't think it's that important right now. And if I can kill something else that hasn't activated, that's more powerful. So a lot of times that's what I look at. So with some of those crap models that you're talking about where it's like, oh yeah, I could easily kill that model. I'll do that sometimes if it means it'll give me an activation advantage. So uh, there was one during, I guess, a week ago, I did kill a test subject just because it hadn't activated. And I was like, that'll give me an activation. And I'll also drop a ski marker or a plant explosive marker to score. So usually if you can, if you can kill it and do something else, I prefer that, but if it's just going to give me activation control and it's going to get take, you know, just take me maybe one swing or two swings, I'll definitely do that because activation control is big. Is it is it feel easier to kill a model towards the end of a of a turn or towards the beginning? I mean, I feel like at the beginning of a turn, they have things that they could do that could maybe save that model if you don't get them down. Well, that's what and I'm how saying. Do you determine going after them to just wound them a little bit versus kill them. Oh no. Right. If you're going to, if you're going to do it, you want to kill the model. You want to have, this is my beat stick or this is a model. Mm -hmm. I can kill this right now. I'm going to do it because it'll give me activation control. So those are usually cheaper models. Like for, uh, for you, you've probably noticed a lot of times I'll ignore your drudges unless they actually can do something that turn and they haven't activated yet. And like, cool, now I'll kill your drudges because that'll just take me one or two swings. Right. We're t- well, we're talking about activation <laughs> control, Dixon. So he was asking about like, when do you kind of decide to kill a model if you have like an easy kill? And I was telling him like, if it activates, a lot of times I don't waste my AP on it because I want to kill it when I can then benefit from having that activation uh, leg oh. up. Yes, because that's the key. the The key difference is like I want to say priority. I would be like, is it gonna get points? Can I deny the points? And you just keep going down a line. So you basically have to write it out in your head yeah. or paper, and then be like, okay, so I don't want this. I don't have they activated? That is a really interesting hits. thing to keep in mind. I I, I have not yeah. thought that way at all. Is well, has this model activated? I mean, other than. Like, are they going to be able to score a specific scheme that they're looking at? But I, I just haven't thought about that. Yeah. But, like, and, and I just want to, again, one more clarify, a clarification. Did Pete say why was it important about the how, how they activated? Like, like the other points about it? Um. Yeah, I mean, yeah, just to... Okay. Just to, yeah, did not, yeah, I mean, so, deny that activation, essentially, you know, it, Yep. Right. But why is it bad for you to kill it after? 
That's what I'm saying. Oh, I mean, uh, from from what I'm understanding, it would just be that, like, hey, it's already done its thing this turn. It's not really worth worrying about. Even it, it's the reactionary thing that we talked yes. about earlier. Um, is I'm just you know right, I would just right. be reacting to it then, versus, yeah. Yes, and and because like remember reaction not bad yeah. if it has a purpose, uh, but in this case, you are not verifying that those actions can be put to further yep. you getting points. So the only reason why you would kill a model that already activated is because him being alive is going to give yep. points to the opponent. So you don't want to den- you don't want to like you remove that as an option from your head. You want to be like, okay, is this model necessary? If no, I'm gonna have to yeah. do something else to get points. So that's, I just want to point that thought in your head because I don't want the you know you, you probably won't do this, but there are people that will oversimplify and be like, well, that model activated. I don't know. I, right. I I can get to it. Yeah, more now. I understand. Yeah, uh, you Dixon earlier you you did mention hand economy and that's another thing that with i with with anya's crew honestly and with maxine's crew there's a lot of discard to do this discard to do this and i find myself focusing on doing those actions that do the discards and then all of a sudden oh shoot i i <laughs> probably discarded more than i should have you know yeah I remember that you guys have a way to draw. Yeah, the operatives technically Yannick. can draw. I think cards. Operatives draw can. Cards. I figured that out. Like remembering the card draw and how, and how important that is. That's another thing. As a well, new player, I, I, I think sometimes as a, forgo that. You yeah, know? I think as a new player, you also it takes a lot of practice to earmark like I need this card for that thing this turn, and once you start doing that, that helps with your hand control because. Uh, I mean, there's especially now playing Rezzers, there's a lot of times where I need like a four or five of masks. So I'll just draw my hand. I'm like, okay, that's a 10 of masks. So that's got to be Manos's Leap or that's got to be Archie's Leap. Uh, I have a high crow and I'm playing the Dead Rider. I'm like, okay, I really want to make sure that his, you know, melee goes off once. Here's a high crow. That's a Dead Rider card. So I think doing that with your hand and being like, okay, this is going to be a discard. This is going to be a discard. This is for that model. That's when you start to kind of really figure out your hand management, because when you're newer, Mm -hmm. you're kind of just using your cards for whatever at the moment. But as you plan out your turn to figure out, okay, I need this to score that. I need this for the ride with me. I need this for the fly with me. Um, The good thing about playing Anya is you don't need to save for triggers because everything has price of progress. Right. Well, I think that's what screwed me up because Ani <laughs> was the second major keyword I ever played. I actually I started with Kin in Ophelia, so I started with Bayou. Uh, that was my first crew I ever built and, and played. But then I went to I went to Anya, and I didn't have to think about the suit, suit yeah. because and now you, <laughs> I could just ping for damage and get the suit. And now and you're now playing Maxine. I'm finally having to think about it with Maxine. <laughs> Who cares about suits <laughs> like, all over the place? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I feel That's, like just the, peop- the people I've played, I haven't th- had to think about it much. But even still within Maxine, there are triggers that you need to remember for certain suits that are outside of their reconfigure that are still really good. Yeah. That, yeah, I, I'm not very good with that for sure so far is remembering that card. Like, oh, yeah, I could do that this turn, you know. No, I'm pretty sure there's also other ways. Uh, how How comfortable are you with... Uh, what's the no- name of that stupid upgrade from from Explorers? The one that the uh, flush with cash out of your hand and draws three or something. It's like it's been a pretty big yeah, staple for me lately. As soon as I discovered <laughs> that, I was like, "Holy crap, this is great!" Uh, I've been putting it on both my operatives. Yeah. Uh, and then they just hang okay. out of around the drudges, right. <laughs> and every time the freaking drudges tra- die, then I get to. Well, you can also uh, spend soul a soul stone. And- well, you can spend a soul stone too, which helps them because they're so squishy. That you mm-hmm. can be like, cool, I'm going to mm-hmm. give you a soul stone to not have my operative die. Yep. That is... Uh-huh. Damn, oh my god. Cause yeah, they dr- die, die left die and like right, crazy. and so I'm and actually you- trying to figure out a way to combine oh. that with the botanists also, so they can just eat up the corpses and... Uh, yeah. 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 I didn't even think about that, because I know that one of the best 
factions or keywords, whatever you want to call it, for that specific upgrade is also Cadmus. Because Cadmus loses eye, uh, eyes and ears all the time. True. <laughs> So yeah, that's that's an interesting. Yeah, thing. and that's another thing. I think just getting used to upgrades that can be something that uh, that definitely takes a minute as well to figure out which ones are good and then which ones you just never bring. Yep. Like I, I've looked at the other explorers and in, in other not. than maybe marker removal, one of them. Tra- I think treasure. Yeah, it's not very treasure good. map. Um, You're messing with the if best you one. really needed it, I suppose. But yeah, I'm missing the best one. No, I'm saying you're messing with the best yeah. one. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the other two yes. don't get brought a lot. It's, mm-hmm. uh, I think you got, once you start also doing the the draw engine, or not a draw engine, but like you get comfortable with the EVS car manipulation. I think it was Andre that played her for like a year and a half or two years or something. Yeah, like I was that. playing and with Maxine Run. people just on card. Yeah, just on cards. Just because he had so much. Like manipulation of like what's gonna happen. Oh yeah, Trevor's been that, stacking yeah. his deck full of all sorts of nonsense that. cards. That's right. For sure. Yeah. So I figured that out, and then and then I felt like, okay, well, what should I do? <laughs> so, I, I almost got the there, whole like freezing in time thing because I'm like, well, there I was have so many things that I could do. I don't know what to do. There was a turn but, where Trevor just I and I I literally told Trevor I was like. You're just sitting on gas in your hand, aren't you? You just have nothing but severes. And he's like, yeah, but I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> I, had, I had like three kings and, uh, you know, two queens. It was it was good. I was playing Seamus, though, so I was playing a little like hit and run. Dude. So I was not giving him a lot of targets to use those with. Yeah, I wasn't uh, close enough. I mean, Kia, uh, were you playing with Yeah, Kia? I wasn't near her. I was like, screw that screw yeah. that lady. Okay. She t- she's yeah, taking a little bit of... It learning for me i'm gonna play her again soon okay. and just try to really well, get her down and i think yeah, she is she costs a lot and so. i think you have to take so especially w- when you play against me trevor i think you had to play that with a, like a pinch of salt because like i see kia and i know what she does so like the only target dixon that i gave so he had kia fast and he had a stacked hand mm-hmm. and i put the only target he had in range was manos but it was a walk, and I was on the other side of a forest. So he had to walk, he had to charge, but I have extended reach, so he doesn't get anything. So he only got one swing into Manos. Doesn't she have a gun, though? I was behind a forest. It's completely Yeah, we were on opposite sides. Yeah. That was the only thing that was near her. Mm-hmm. So, so oh, and that's, that's the thing you got to keep in mind is, like, the types of crew people are going to play against you and the players also you're going to play against, you know, some people like to come up and like just smash face and just, you know, I'm going to fight. You know, Mm -hmm. I I traditionally don't play that kind of style, which I think you've noticed. I kind of just kind of, I'll skirt the edges, just kind of see what you do. And then I react to it. When you go in for damage, you're most likely going to take me out. That's what I've noticed. I'm planning on killing you. Once you go in, yeah. then you've got some plan to do it. <laughs> you know? Yeah, because the thing is, Pete has had to learn how to. Well, and you, this. you also don't. He, he had and to. I think this is the cool <laughs> part about the stream because when not the stream, the bat report that's going to come out because there was a moment where I did whisper and I looked at my cards and I was like, well, I can't do that now. So, as a new player, I don't think you see kind of like the mentality behind it because there are some times where I look at my cards and I'm like. I have a kill in my hand. Like when you had that, that stacked hand, you want to look at that and be like, I can kill something. Now, how do I set that up? And that's, Mm -hmm. and then it's the opposite when you have a crap hand where you're like, man, this really sucks. How do I drag out this turn and kind of just score points while I'm waiting on something with this GG, like it being so schemey. I feel like I'm even less so getting taught how to kill things because I'm not even, I'm not as focused on it and I'm taking most that are not, about damage or killing you know yeah so in the chat i just put in what i told harlequin because literally pete just said the one of the questions that harley had if you see it you don't have to understand it but it's basically i wrote for him how to do a kill on a model uh this this model in, in question was actually candy and pete knows how hard it is to kill candy. that little girl yeah so Pete, Pete is 100% right. 
And you have to write it down. I literally wrote it down for him because, like, there's many, many ways to do optimization. So, like, if you want to, uh, this is just mostly for Trevor and Inspire. That is uh, Lucius jumping in and killing him up. So now you have that also knowledge, not just for Lucius, but when, when, you know, whenever somebody's going to come into you. Just follow, like, a game plan. Okay, I have to do these actions in this specific way yeah Yeah. and i've been so focused on list building lately that what i used to do when i was just playing like one keyword and i hadn't added in maxine yet or anything like that because now i'm trying to balance who to play for what since i have two full you know keywords and everything but I used to write down, I I called them cute things because that's what you guys call them. (laughs) That's (laughs) cute. Cute things that go off. Uh, And so I would write, I wrote down cute things and I had a list of the cards to do that for what. And I just haven't done that in a while. I think, I feel like I need to come back to that now that I'm more comfortable with my lists. Yeah. And and you want to set up kills for like a purpose, right? So this GG, you're right. It's more scheming. So when you kill something, it really should have a purpose behind it. Um, If you're just attacking something, just, because, you know, it's there. That's probably the wrong answer. So, like, you know, a, a game that we played, Trevor, you you brought Tannenbaum. And I'm like, I can't let this dude live. Like, this dude, <laughs> I need to find a way to kill it. So I sent two models at him, and you kind of stuck his nose out a little bit too far. So then I decided to kill yeah. him. Yeah. I left him alone, and and he paid the price for it. So Yes. There are two things to, for newer players that are listening in. Uh, he can change a scheme mid-game. And basically, you guarantee that you're going to get the second point. And he discards your hand at the yeah. end of the turn. The, so eventually, when you get good at the game enough, you're going to hold bad cards in your hand just so you can discard them at the beginning of the turn. Yep. And he says no yeah. to that. And combined combined between good. that and Anya 2 and Winston, basically, you're up he had cards. a five-card hand. I had a seven-card hand. And then you're down to discarding the rest of your hand with Tannenbaum in there. Yeah, that's, so, and that's what you want to yeah. do. You want to identify, I don't like that in that list. I need to either neutral it. So like Candy, for example, like there's not a lot of things that can effectively kill Candy. You can grind her down, but usually it's a you're not getting your, your action economy there. So usually mm-hmm. when I play against Candy, I just try to displace or just kind of try to neuter her activation as much as possible. So that's when... I feel like a good toss 10 inches away is good to deal with candy. So it's like just yes. bowling with candy. Yeah. yeah I, that actually is by far the best uh, advice I've heard anybody say. So it's, it bears repeating. Do not try to fight candy if you can just toss her 10 inches. Yeah, I mean, unless you <laughs> unless you have the answers, right? Like, I, I feel like Archie would be able to deal with candy pretty well. Uh, as long as he doesn't trigger i mean as long as he always triggers yeah. something yes you're absolutely right i i he has to i stuck tannenbaum's nose out there too far because he has chatty also mm-hmm. which makes you discard to interact which with these strategies i mean is it's good pretty good if you have him hang around one of the ballot boxes or the cloak and dagger um to interact and stuff like that having them have to discard yeah. But I, but you need I should have emissary. had him close to my people still. <laughs> well, uh, no, you need a, you need the emissary as the problem for Tannenbaum to be able to use his well, chatty because Tannenbaum doesn't have. Many well, I was going to say yeah, also that you can deter your opponent from doing things like attacking your so like attacking your model where it's kind of an easy kill. So a good example of this is I played a game where uh, Ma Tucket could have just won. Or t- not one shot, but she could have probably two shot at Archie. Uh, she's just really good at just dealing like spiky damage. And my opponent had it on the board, I'm pretty sure. And I had kind of a crap hand, so I was like, "Yeah, if he goes in the Archie, Archie's dead because Maw has Ruthless, so this is bad." Yep. But I have the Dead Rider nearby, and that was enough deterrent because he's like, "Yeah, I can kill Archie, but then I got to take you know two or three hits from the Dead Rider." That might kill Maw, so do I go into it? So a lot of times, if you just have backup with a model, that might deter your opponent from engaging in that point because then they'll get punished, you know, for the retaliation of, you know, trying to take out your model. Yeah. Oh, that, that's another... Thank you, P. Actually, uh, that goes into the next uh, thing that I talked about with Harley. It was don't, don't short 
the action economy. I mean, don't shock the actions that your opponent needs to kill your models. So, for example, in the example that Pete was talking about, if Ma goes into Archie, the rider now has less actions to get yeah. to Ma. That means more attacks on yeah. Ma. So, don't short... Don't, don't make it easier, basically. Don't make it easier for your opponent. And, and the way that you do, don't do that is basically positioning. Because, like, the biggest difference, the way biggest difference between the best players and the worst players is the little details, like where the model is on the table, how many actions it's going to take to lay the model, the priority, and finally the, uh, uh, whatchamacallit, the activation control. Yeah, very few models, so you can actually do those very few models get one-shotted in Malifo, which I think is a good thing. So I think if you can start putting it where you, if your opponent comes into you, and they only get one swing, that's a good activation. Like if you're giving your opponent opportunities where they're getting two, three, four swings on a model, that model is just going to die. So you want to try to set it up where it's like, okay, they can walk and then charge. Okay. They're going to get one swing. I can, you know, defend against that a little bit, but if they come in and, you know, they are charging you they're Basically, if I'm a, if I have a model engaging me and my opponent has like this disgusting beater, like Dixon likes to do this all the time, where he just throws this beater in your face, yes. you have to do one. You have to either make it where its actions now suck, so that's putting out things like slow, distracted, you know, so their attacks, n- yeah, not, they're not as good. Disengaging from yeah. them, getting away, displacing the model. Yep. Or killing the model. So that's what you have to do when there's a threat like that in your face because you can't let, if you if you want to consistently win games, you can't let your opponent just have a model in your face and beat you down with it and you're just sitting there slugging it out. It's like, that's just how you lose games because you're leaving it up to the cards, yes. you're leaving it up to your opponent. Whereas I try to make that so, activation as crappy as possible. So, so yeah, so you're trying to tag on conditions that'll make their next ex- activation yeah, suck, yeah. essentially. Uh, not When you mean conditions, you mean just like in general, not like putting like slow and stagger and stuff like that, right? You just mean... Well, I guess I meant both because, I mean, that like I guess if you put on slow, then, you know, you're they're only not going to be swing. able to do as much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But, the reason, the reason why I want to be specific about that is, like, say in the example that Pete was talking about, right? Say Ma was near somebody like Bryn that had the Diversion Aura. And you're engaging it with Bryn, right? You're engaging, what's his name, uh, with Bryn. Um, you Archie. just said it, Archie. If Archie is engaging Bryn with the Diversion Aura, Archie is yeah. sad. Archie's super sad. He can attack. He's at a negative. He, he has to disengage. Yeah. Yeah. So that is a that is a lot. He can't leap out either. That, like, <laughs> can't leap out, can't get the positive from his bonus action. Oh, interesting. He's and he's only moved off, four, like, so yeah. if you flip a moderate, he just doesn't move. <laughs> what does that aura yes. do? So, so the diversion aura makes it where you don't get a bonus. That's the twelve cups mm. of coffee. Uh, you don't you don't get to do bonus. Enemy models don't do bonus actions while within four inches of this model. Are leaps usually a bonus? Yes, they are always uh, a bonus. Okay, that They're is always. I'm, I'm gonna write that down too. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. There's not many models that have it. I think in Neverborn, all of Bayou is just you know, Dreamer. Bayou has it as an upgrade. Mm. And I think there's one more model, and I yeah. can't remember who it is. Yeah. So that and that's kind of what I'm saying is making it as least efficient for your opponent as possible. Uh, That's why I like Molly so much because I can literally put her in the middle of it. She has three incontinence. There you go. Alan Reed has diversion. So, uh, so Molly has three incontinence. So it's harder to go. You have to have a positive to go into her. Otherwise it's just not worth it. Uh, She also can put out slow. She also puts out distracted just by discarding cards. So Molly is just this, eight inch bubble of I'm going to make your activations as crappy as possible. If you come near me. So she's a deterrent Mm. by herself. So if I see something scary, I just kind of move her up and just be like, cool, you suck now. And you suck now. (laughs) Hmm. Yeah. And uh, again, for the listeners, two damage doesn't seem like a lot, but it is a third of a six point model. So don't dismiss it just because it's two damage. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes you just you you need to chip a model down. Sometimes two damage on a master is good because 
if they use a soul stone, sometimes that feels wasteful and they're yeah. more likely, I feel like, too damaged to just kind of let it slide. Dude, Cackle forced Titania to use her melee attack. Just think about that yeah, for a second. Fair. <laughs> I mean, it's it, it's interesting because you'll let it slide. What I've noticed for me as a player is I'll let a damage go through, even if it is just too damage. But then my next activation with that master, I'm like, oh wait, they're a little hurt, and so then I do something different because of it. Yeah. Even though it's just a little bit of damage. Um, yes. Yeah. That's part of the reactions that you still need to. You 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 have to react in the game. You just can't let reactions dictate your entire game plan yeah yeah that's why i said that you have to kind of like balance it between both because you you activate right say you have second activation depending on what your opponent does you have to do something yeah. different yes yeah, spire uh there's no such thing as little damage <laughs> <laughs> like that yeah oh that's so funny um you were talking about modules right um, and, and kind of creating these little packs and these little groups of people, you know, of, of models that you send out together. I'm, I'm also still trying to balance how much to bubble people up and how much not and yeah. when to let that group go out. Uh, and then it's also yeah. dependent on what master you're against, too. So it's, it's, it's even harder to explain it, to be honest, because even though that I have a lot of years of experience playing these games uh, I get like for example Angel I played against him like two or three months ago and I still think about that game every now and then he played Parker and I just realized just how many little things he does that are just like quality of life that I have to improve in my game plan like dropping a scheme marker at a specific moment waiting a specific amount of activation before he springs a trap like just just the my the most minute of things you'll you'll notice as you keep playing the game it'll be like okay so i learned this now so therefore i need to adjust and it's just gonna keep happening because I, I i'm telling you i i i i've won so many games and i still feel like there's so much crap that i need to learn yeah. i think that's why this game has drawn me in so much honestly like as a new player and somebody that's never played a you know, because I had to get into the hobby part of it. Don't get me wrong. I've, I've painted models for D&D and stuff before, but I've never had to do something like this where you build with the little pieces. And I started with kin, which wasn't great, <laughs> but where you have to build. But now I've come to enjoy the hobby side of it where I get to like, I'll just listen to a podcast or I'll throw up Star Trek in the background because I'm trying to make it through all those episodes and just let it play while I'm painting so there's there's just multiple aspects to playing this game yeah. that you then get a little zen time out of it, and then there's so much strategy. You guys are still having conversations years later, figuring things out about keywords. It's yep, yeah. I'm the little details sufficiently man. I'm hooked. You right now, <laughs> the little details. I get it. The, reason, the reason why we talk about it is because the little details just come out in these conversations. Like every now and then, you'll say something and be like, "Oh well, yeah," and because it's a. Makes- this yeah, because it's a better. skirmishing game, one model change in your list can make a huge difference. And even a change in deployment or a change in, you know, a scheme or the strat, that makes the game play so much different. Like, that game we played yesterday, Dixon, if it was standard or wedge, is a totally different game than what we played yesterday. Oh, a thousand percent. If it was wedge, I'd be dead. <laughs> Like the one thousand percent reason why I did as well as I did in that game is because of of corner of the play. That's why, the, and that's why the game's cool. Me. And then now we have titles, right? So yes. the titles make it fresh. And then they are about every year they have new models that come out for the factions. So then you have those new mm-hmm. models to freshen it up. So that, I think that's the longevity of Malifaux in general. Well, yeah. by the way, if it had been wedge, I would have picked a scheme that would have been in your deployment yeah. zone from yeah. right away. That way I would have been able to score in turn one. I mean, playing Anya's crew, I like I said, I literally played Anya for about three or four months before I bought more models and I, you know, got to build EVS and I had bought some of the versatile. And every time I added a different versatile model into it, it changed things and I felt like I learned more. And even once I had built EVS, I, I was like, I still don't feel like I'm done playing syndicate yet. I, I don't feel like okay. I'm done. 
Yeah. You know? Oh. There are keywords, though, that you... It's not that you're going to learn everything, but if it will feel like you have Yeah, you're comfortable everything. with For example, mm-hmm. McKay. Like, McKay, I feel... which is also in... Yeah, I was just going to say, I feel like, uh, Trevor, you're more comfortable with Anya than you ever felt like with Kin. Like, Kin just didn't feel like a good yes. fit for you. <laughs> 100%. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yep. I mean, it might be one of those keywords that you just have to put in the, the, the games. Like I like I keep saying with Sorita, it took me forever, and I'm still a moderate Sorita player. I'm not even that good with her. Uh, so Kin might just take a long, long time. Well, Explorer Society just felt like home to me too. Plus, like Kin is really like shooty and stuff like that, and I'm just not. Yes. I don't know. It just doesn't interest me all that much. Um, it's just I like as soon as I started playing Syndicate, Explorers, even all the stories and the lore, it just felt felt a lot more like home. It it yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And you get a mix of like different types of people, monsters and stuff. But uh, what I was gonna say with McKay, uh, McKay is one of those keywords that is so um, forgiving that you might just feel like, oh, okay, I don't have to learn too much about this keyword. So if you ever want to expand to another keyword and you want to take kind of like a break, quote unquote, play McKay. It makes it so much easier. Okay. Yeah, I, it, I've, I've been building kind of towards that. Um, you know, I'm, for whatever reason, I've just chosen all the female masters. <laughs> I, yeah, I went from Anya <laughs> to Maxine and I have Jedza on deck and, uh, and I have Bygone on deck. So I like all of a sudden I realized, oh, I don't. I don't have any of the. <laughs> I don't have any of the. Dude, other. I forgot that Teary was in Explorers because mm-hmm. I love her in Outcast. Okay. Dude, she is a monster. I'm excited to try her out. I just, I got a little intimidated by the two different upgrades and like flipping back and forth. But it actually doesn't happen that much. It's, okay. Yeah, really, it it's kind of like this yeah. weird. Because the thing is, thing like, that doesn't happen a ton. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you look at the card and be like, okay, so I need this specific trigger, so therefore I'm going to flip it now. Okay. That's it. That's literally Okay, it. it's not as, yeah, cumbersome. <laughs> and okay. no and Nomad's no. better because she's a, just a beast. Yeah, and she also gets to flip it whenever she wants. Mm-hmm. Whereas the other one, specifically, like you'll, you'll have the upgrade for probably three rounds, and then round four, you'll be like, all right, now I'll switch it. <laughs> Those models just look beautiful, too. They they really look weird awesome. alien robots. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Dude, I was As so a excited player, for they her because I thought she was gonna be. I was I thought I was gonna be never born. Uh, Teary was gonna be never born. I saw her. And I was like, listen. Aw. Well, like I like the idea of the ancient technology and the ancient like you know ever burning power within them as constructs. I think that's pretty cool. I was going to actually get Castor, but he sold out on the weird site. So I was like. Well, that saves me some money, and I don't have to figure out another keyword for the moment, so yay. Gee, I wonder why Castore got sold out. I don't out. know, do you, think, do you think he's that good? <laughs> I don't think that he's OP, I, I just think that he's like McKay. He's just so easy to play that he, he feels good, regardless of whether or not you're winning or That's losing. That's fair. I, just, I kind of forget he's yeah. a Rezzer Master, because <laughs> he's not right? undead or anything, so he's kind of like this weird bat demon nephilim return dude i don't know and he's one of those masters that just feels significantly different like there's dual masters like hoffman that don't feel any different playing in in either faction but castor does like there the upgrades actually make a difference and the choice of models makes well yeah i think so it was funny i forget who it was on it was another discord it might have been students of conflict they were like, I just listened to the Rezzer episode, and I threw up with how disgusting Rezzer's <laughs> models are. Because <laughs> it's true. You go down the list, and you're like, oh, God, this is a pain in the ass to deal with. And the thing is that they're very min max. Yeah. Uh, if you look at all the damage dealers or models that are really fast, they have, like, garbage stats or are expensive as all get out. But surprisingly still good. Yeah, well, look at, look at, we literally had that joke about uh, Diversion and Archie. Yeah. Like, Bryn next to Archie makes us sad. Yeah, there's, Archie. and there's some matchups where <laughs> I look at playing Archie and I'm just like, if they bring these models, that kind of, the, the cool thing is you can put Killer Instinct on him. So if they bring Manipulative, that helps get around that. Um, so that, that is one play around, but then you're looking at like a, 
eleven twelve stone model. But uh, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of just knowing like when it's on the board. I'm like, and that's when you know your opponent knows what's going on. So like when I play you, Dixon, you know you're like, oh, Archie can't go into that model because he'll be at a negative right. because Archie can't get around it. He has no way to gain focus, no way to get around it. So if you have a negative, Archie literally can't attack you. So you're like, this model's safe. Archie literally can't go there. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's the, the reason why. I, I had that joke when I was playing against Skakul. Uh I played Harada in the, the Harada in Dorian Crow yeah. module. If you ever see this on Vassal Trevor or anywhere on real life, you are negatives and you need to flip a 10 on willpower. Archie's willpower 4. Just think about that for a second. You can't get bonuses. You are at a negative, and there's nothing else you can do about it. Mm. Like Archie was just like, I need to flip double sixes to be able to hit you Yeah, and, be, and being able to switch, because when Archie or a model like that is in a bad position, switching to a point where it's like, okay, I can't, he's not a beater at this point. I need to go scheme with him. There's sometimes mm-hmm. where I literally threw Shen Long into my deployment zone, and I just left him. Like, I was playing Sandeep, so I tossed him into my deployment zone. And I was just like, cool, Shen Long, have fun in my deployment zone. And I just ran off. And Shen Long literally had to be like, I know I like punching stuff, but I need to scheme because otherwise I'm just wasting actions. So knowing when to switch. You did that like in three games. You did that in Dude, that's why Stan Deep's so awesome, man. You're just like, oh, Oh, hey, you have this size two model that's annoying? Get out. (laughs) Yeah. Bad vibes out of here. You, he has like multiple ways to do toss or or kick out a up model. We, That's up the we thing go. That sucks about that. <laughs> yeah, because like uh, in our case, the reason why he beat me six five is because Hinamatsu was completely out of position twice in the game, literally. So she was like ten inches away from everything. So she had to like walk and charge, and then he did it again. And then she's like, "I'm just getting like two attacks out of this. This is just not yeah. worth it." So I lost the game on that. So. Trevor, any other uh, questions on your little piece of paper there or anything else that popped in your Uh, head? Nothing I've got down here other than uh, in the chat there, Spire uh, mentioned he's really excited for Asses of Malifaux. (laughs) Ashes of Malifaux, I would assume. (laughs) Um, Everybody keeps uh, mistyping. What is that and what is Madness of Malifaux? Like, I'm I'm getting more into the lore and stuff and reading through, but, like, what are are these things? So... You play D&D, right? You play D&D? Play, played what? D&D? Yeah. You played D&D. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. So that's like saying Tomb of, Tomb of Annihilation. It's just an extra expansion. So basically, the uh, they do it to okay. advance the story. So the book tells, like, yep. hey, here's some new stories. Here's what's kind of going on with the narrative of the game. And then usually... In those books, they also give each faction a new model or two that they can then use in the game. Okay. So in this one, it is apparently a bunch of dual keyword mm. models from the same factions. Mm. That's been the rumor. Yeah. So and I'm excited to that's see it. Two books ago, that's where we got the titles. The titles came out with this book that was an expansion. Um, so usually they do it every year, year and a half. They'll come out with a new book, and then it has new models in it for you to use in the game. Okay. Oh, yeah. And they write oh, them yeah. into the lore of yep. the story and how they fit. Yep. Okay. Yep. So you get new models, you get a new fluff or lore, and you basically get, uh, whatchamacallit, what's the other thing? Furthering uh, the, Adv- the Advancing the story, the yeah. Instead. Okay. Well, pro- what I mean by progressing is like sometimes we get new stuff like Damien. He introduced the faction yeah. upgrade. Oh, so new mechanics. Uh, the, the, yeah, a little. Sometimes it's something like that. Yeah, something to freshen up the pot a little bit. Okay. Yep. That's cool. Yeah, but no. I, as far as my questions go, I, th- I went through all of them. Um, I'm sure there will be more that pop up, but this has actually been extremely helpful talking this through with you guys. Uh, And, you know, I always laugh at Trevor with his notepad, but, you know, whatever works for you for kind of, (laughs) you know, learning the game, that's what you want to do as a new player. Mine was getting smashed, you know, and destroyed violently in tournaments. (laughs) That's how I learned. I, I was forged by, you know, the fires of Mount Doom 
just getting smashed yeah. by all these really experienced, you know, East Coast players. Pete's first uh, iteration against somebody outside of his meta was me playing Titania into his Wong. It was it was adorable. I have all this in my first sports. one out of meta, but I have like little sports yeah. playbook drawings of unpacks. <laughs> No, dude, I used oh, to I do, do that all something time. incredibly similar. Yeah. I put but mine you, on my do? table. I'll just put my models uh-huh. out. I'm like, okay, this model goes that far. Then I do this, and it pushes it that far to see how far it actually yeah. looks on the board. Okay. that's So yeah. what, I, what I wanted to point out is I used to do the exact same thing that you're doing with Vassal mm-hmm. back in the day because Vassal has been around forever. And with tokens, I used to write the thing that I needed to do with a token and just put the token like right next to my master and then end of turn i'll be like looking around and be like you know visually look at the model on the table so if it works for you with a with a notebook notepad don't worry about it yeah like, it works every uh, different for everybody well and that's not like illegal for me to have at the tournament either is it like no. i can i can have a little oh. notepad next to me right yeah that's fine that's right yeah and that's the good thing about clocks is it's on your time. So if you want to sit there and reference, it's the same thing as like looking up your cards or, you know, looking mm-hmm. up, you know, something on your phone. Um, obviously, you don't want to be like texting, you know, somebody from a different table. Like he just oh, activated yeah. this model. What do I do? <laughs> yeah, that's a different. That, that crosses yeah. the line into unreasonable. Yeah, but like if it's something that yeah. you wrote down. Yeah, that's fine. Mm-hmm. Little crib note. That's fine. So, oh, uh, do you have to manage the app? like? So, are tournaments more official through the app, where you have to put the conditions on them no. through the app? Where you have okay. Does, Some people do, and I hate it. I prefer it to be on the card and on the board. Um, yeah, but uh, that's that's fine. Yeah. I mean, they can yeah. play on the app, so I don't throw a hissy fit. But yeah, I'd say most people play, you know, on the cards or on the table. Okay, I don't like having cards because you're a degenerate. Uh, so that's the only thing. Yeah, the only thing that I don't do is mark damage on the card on the app. Yeah, I reference the the cards on the app and I look through all the stuff, but conditions and everything is tokens. I have little tokens and dice. Okay, and I just put the dice to mark the health and tokens to mark uh, conditions and stuff like that. Yeah, I feel like the tokens. Like I'm a more tactile person, so like I feel like the tokens and stuff just feel better for me with the app. I feel like it would take a lot of time. I don't know. Maybe it wouldn't, but maybe it'd take a lot of time to pop in there, put on the condition. It's, you know, now this is burning and this one's got focused. And I don't know. It just felt that felt more cumbersome to me than getting little tokens and just putting them on my card. But I just wasn't sure with the tournament if they were going to require it to be that way so that there's no, well, I didn't know he was. Yeah distracted yeah and that's kind of the thing is i'm very visual where i like to look i don't like so especially in a tournament i don't like to ask questions like that to my opponent because then that gives them an idea of what line of play i'm thinking about so i'll look at the board and be like okay this guy has burning five that guy is down to half health this one is distracted too and then i can make a play off of that without because if you ask your opponent like Hey, how many hit boxes does that model have? That kind of lets them know you're yes. looking at to kill that model. The only time I yeah. ask that question is when I'm activating and I'm like, I can kill that model if it's at this certain point. That's the only time yeah. I'll verbalize it, and then they have no reaction because I'm going in. <laughs> yeah, that'll yeah. definitely yeah, yeah. probably change for me for the competition because you and you know you and I, and then whoever I play with, even in the local meta, I'll ask that question because it's kind of like, well, I'm just testing things out, I'm trying things out, I'm having fun. Yeah. But I feel like in a right. tournament, I'll be much more tight lipped and look it up on the uh, app instead. <laughs> so that. Actually, uh, something that I do to beat a lot, uh, to anybody really that I play, uh, and it failed in Lone Star because he did not fall for any of my traps. I say a lot of things to kind of put like a verbal cue in yeah. your head. And Pete knows this because he'll be like, be like, I bet you, I bet you I want me to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, eventually Pete And then it becomes a, a Princess my... Bride scene where it's like, you think I think that you know that I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so be aware of that because I say a lot of things or I'll measure something just to put that thought on your head and be like, wait, why did he measure that? Right, yeah, you just so, put a little tape over there like the other day when yes. I had Calypso and Beeb and I measured 24 inches from one corner to the other. I was like, whoa, and, no, no. Hey, what are you doing? <laughs> Keep him away from me. Bro, I'm telling you. 
It works. Bluffing in this game. Well, is and you can yeah, even like you could use that where it's like, oh, I'm just measuring his threat range, and your opponent's like, what the crap is he talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, uh, like the other. Oh, yeah, you guys. The other day, I, I uh, Pete was like, uh, Archie was like, just in a general direction, so I measured out. I think it was like 19 inches, and be like, oh, good. The nerf of one inch is totally working. <laughs> But I think we're going to leave it there, guys. we got a lot of good stuff for, I think, people to chew on, uh, you know, going into competitive play and list building and some other things. Um, counter tech. So thanks for uh, coming on, Trevor. You did a, did a bang-up job. Sounds like you've done this oh, before. Oh, thanks a lot. Yeah, I, I appreciate you having me. I, yeah, I, I used to stream, so I feel comfortable with it. And uh, But, but yeah, I, I definitely appreciate you guys having me on. This was extremely helpful for me, especially because I've got two coming up we've got one locally here in wichita and then i'll be at captain con um yep i'm macabrious by the way in the chat um in discord so that's my that's my tag there yep so the the discord will see uh and just you can imagine trevor asking those questions and then writing it down on his uh pad of the answer to your question. yes <laughs> I should actually do that more often because I do forget things that I'm like, ah, I shouldn't have forgot that. But that, say la vie, that's, that's just the way I roll. But uh, I think until next time, make sure that you guys are uh, flipping cards and flipping tables. We'll see y'all later. Ciao.